guys have. Thank you for coming to the serious business of humorous memoir panel. Um, I apologize, we're having a little technical difficulties getting the PowerPoint loaded, so um, we're working on it and we will definitely uh, hopefully have these before the end of the, the slide, uh, the panel, but we wanted to at least get started because we are always you know, kind of up against the clock. We have four people, four very talented cartoonists that we want to uh, give as much time to speak as possible. So with that in mind, I'm actually going to ask you guys to introduce yourselves instead of me doing it. Um, and if you, did, if you wouldn't mind, talk a little bit about sort of your comics and the kind of subjects that you guys deal with. So Keith, why don't you start? Okay, uh, my name is Keith Knight. I do, um, I do several comic strips, but what I'm most known for is a strip called The Key Chronicles, uh, which is not a biographical comic strip uh, I've been doing since, I think, 1993. So it's been quite a long time. <laughs> and, um, but I also do uh, a strip called The Nightlife, which is a d sort of a daily network television version of The Key Chronicles that runs locally in the Washington Post on Sunday. So there's a strip in there right now uh, in today's paper. But um, <clears throat> I essentially came up with the Kate Chronicles in the early 90s as just an answer to what I saw was a dearth of representation. I wanted to do a strip. You know, back then, you know, gangster rap was huge and, and anytime they showed somebody that was into rap on TV or something, oh, they were in a gang or whatever. And it was like, that didn't reflect anybody that I knew or who I was. So I wanted to do a strip about people that were into hip hop that were actually uh, into other music and, and politically motivated and also um, uh, into nerd stuff and, and different things like that. So it sort of grew out of that to provide a strip that represented someone that I could relate to, and it just grew from there. So, and now, we just rule the world, so I don't know. <laughs> How do you do anymore? I, I wish. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's November Garcia, and yes, I was born in November, and um, I'm from the Philippines, born and raised, and my, my comic is called Foggy Notions, and it's about my um, 13 years that I lived in San Francisco. So, and all the foolishness that happened to, sorry to say, not, not too long ago, but yeah. And I also have a mini called Malarkey, and it's mostly diary stuff. And um, yeah, this is my first pub, uh, published book in the United States. And this is my first panel, so bear with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my name's Glynis Fox, and I have two books and more here, but one of them's new from Kilgore called Reign of Crumbs, um, comics about my kids and my family, and another one's called Greek Diary, which is about my um, working as an archaeological illustrator, which I did for a lot of years before uh, um, discovering comics. And um, this book is also about traveling with my family and how awful it was. Um, I've recently had two um, comic pieces on The New Yorker online about um, the same subject and about how my daughter is, feels aversion for my body. So. <laughs> All right. I'm Jennifer Hayden, and um, I uh, got into comics, I would say, late, although now everybody's doing it at whatever time of life they, they, they get possessed. Um, uh, I had been through breast cancer, and I wanted to write about the experience for other women going through it, and I uh, discovered graphic novels at that time. I was 43, and I started doing The Story of My Tits, which um, took about 10 years to uh, get finished and get into print from Top Shelf. It came out in 2015. And it doesn't just tell the story of my breast cancer. I'm a pretty thorough person, and I, I began at the beginning um, with my um, uh, self with my tits as a child and worked forward from there. Um, and while I was uh, working on that, I ended up uh, getting invited to contribute uh, a, um, 
a strip to activate, which is a Brooklyn-based um, group uh, that I keep popping the mic. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, that no longer exists, but they were very welcoming uh, to this middle-aged uh, chick from the suburbs, and uh, they were all, you know, young hipsters. And I contributed underwire to their um, their uh, website, and it ended up getting. Uh, it was stories about my kids and my husband. And it was a nice break from all of the digging in my past. I was doing the other book, and uh, and then it got away from me. My ADD was was just making me concentrate on it, not the other book, and I got um, Top Shelf to publish a collection uh, to um, that that includes what was on the web, but also other stuff. So, I, and it's funny because um, I learned a lot doing Underwire that I took to the other book. Uh, so this was started earlier, then this came out, and then I finished this, and um, and I did use, um, I have to say, a lot of humor to deal with pain, and that's, you know, um, I'm glad we're talking about that today. Thank you. I'm going to very quickly show the other covers, because I think it's super important to show these, and um, so I'm going to just flip through these. Keith, as you can see, has a large body of books. <laughs> it's all tiled. <laughs> and there's Glynis. Jennifer and November. We didn't sit in the right order. Yes. I know. I'm so glad we got these. I should have. Yeah. Uh, I'm really glad we got these up and running because one of the things that I asked each of the panelists to do was to, to send me one example from their work that really kind of, you know, sort of captured and reflected the spirit of humor and memoir that they could talk us through. And so I'm going to go through these. Keith, I think you're up first. And maybe you can talk us through this particular strip, which is about um, black on black crime. Uh, yeah, I'll read it for you. Um, but what about black on black crime? Nine out of ten crimes committed against you people are by you people. And, and when I say, and eight out of, out of ten crimes committed against whites are by whites. Even if robberies, murders, and assaults drop to one per day, chances are they'd be black and bl on black or black or white and white. And then he says, try all the logic you want. As long as you people continue to com commit crimes against your own, no one's going to care about police brutality. And then say, perhaps you're right. I mean, I'm feeling good when you're saying, I'm feeling better already. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> one of the things I've been doing um, uh, for years is I've been doing comics about police brutality for the past uh, 25 years, and I developed a slideshow about it uh, about five years ago. Um, just for me, psychologically, to deal with the stuff that go was going on in Ferguson and all that type of stuff. And um, I just started doing it all over the country, and now uh, I've done it beyond the country. I was just in Berlin doing it, and it's really taken off. And basically, it's just a, a, a way to, to discuss like how this is not something new. This has been going on forever, and the only reason why it's in the public eye is everyone has a cell phone now, everyone's on social media. But this has been going on forever, and if we were actually taught um, the history of the way blacks have been treated in this country, no one would be surprised by any of this. No one would be surprised by Charlottesville. No one would be surprised that Trump came in after Obama. Like, we don't teach uh, this na we don't teach its citizens what this, how this na nation was founded, and how, like, literally, it was on the backs of of people that look like me. And so, when people come to me with these arguments. I, I, I try to answer them with the slideshow, with my comics, and it really is like, you know, when people, people don't think these arguments through, so they sit there and go, what about black on black crime? And it's like, literally, you see that whenever, you know, families are murdered, it's generally by the dad or like a boyfriend, like it's, it's white on white crime. No one mentions white on white crime. And there's a lot more white on white crime than black on black crime. But if you use logic, it doesn't really work out. So I just try to do it in simple ways with the comics and stuff. And 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 it's it really it's for me. It's to, it's so I don't go crazy. And frankly, I would have gone crazy a long time ago if I didn't have the outlet to sort of uh, share my experiences. J Jennifer, this is a page from the story of my tits. Can can you kind of tell us what's going on here? 
Um, yeah, this was uh, one of the experiences that I, one of the first things I actually sketched when I was starting to sketch, because I had no idea how to do a graphic novel and I just did one. But I did a few drawings and that Frank and Ted's drawing was one of the first things I did because um, uh, I, had, I had gone to lunch with a woman who wanted to um, give me advice about what I was about to go through, which was a bilateral mastectomy with reconstruction. And she wanted to show me how, you know, it looks and, and how it feels and, and that it was going to be all right. And she gave me this nice little lunch you know, really like conservative, you know, anti-cancer food. And uh, and then she um, lifted her shirt in her kitchen and I had a heart attack looking at these wrecked boobs just going, oh my God, are you serious? This is what I'm about to go through. I don't want to look like that. Um, with, you know, the stitches and stuff. So anyway, it was, uh, and she was very proud of them. She thought they were just the tits, as they say. She, <laughs> and they truly weren't. Um, but I'm happy with my little squares, and, you know, and I, I, in the end, this didn't matter, but at the time, it mattered greatly. And the minute I, the minute she lifted the shirt, I just went frank and tits. Luckily, now, I don't say these things out loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, November, this is um, a strip that you sent me from Foggy Notions. Can you talk a little bit about why you picked this one? Oh yeah, I was, I was commuting home from work and I was so injured. I lent this girl my, my phone. She said, can I make a quick call? And what happened was that she just, I'm like, well, she's sitting on the window side, so I, I can, if anything happens, I can get her. And sure enough, she runs for the door the minute the bus stops. So I run after her and I catch her. Cause, but it wasn't about the phone. It was a crappy phone. It was the principal of the matter. I'm like, you're not going to take advantage of me. So what happens is I end up getting a black eye. And for me, it sounds horrible, but for me, I thought it was a good experience because I always wondered what, what's it like to get punched in the face or in a fist fight? Like, would I win? How, how would I fare out? And, you know, I found out. It, and, um, you know, it's funny because this shoe, uh, what happened was uh, I have a flashback where I was at a party irritated with, like, a, a girl and I kind of kicked her butt and then she turned around and she was like, did you just kick me? And I said, no. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's how I dealt <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's one off the bucket list. So, yeah, now I know what it's like to get a black eye and get hit in the face. So, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> and, Glynis, this is one you sent, and I'm going to have some uh, close-ups so we can read it. But um, tell us about this strip. This is your strip from The New Yorker, right? Can I read this? Yeah, um, I'll zoom in so people can also read along. Hey, hey, kids, today we're going to the museum. I'll stay here. Why do you hate us so much? <laughs> Come on, it will be fun. We won't stay long. Any time in a museum is too long. You know we hate museums. Why do you have to torture us? Maybe once you look around, you'll realize it's interesting. I'm not looking around. I'm not coming. I made them walk around before I gave them the iPad. <laughs> So t tell us why this one was one that you felt kind of represented your body work. Eh, I think it's the um, uh, I'm writing this out of the the pain of wanting my kids to enjoy the things that I enjoy, or wanting to experience things together with them that they absolutely despise. So um, that's the that's the short answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so for, for all of you guys, and maybe I'll start with Jennifer, um, you guys deal with very serious subjects, as we just kind of saw, parenthood and you know, breast reconstruction and get violent attacks and police <laughs> brutality. What is it about humor that enables you to up, um, approach these very serious subjects, and why do you choose to come at them from a, a humorous angle? Well, I mean, you know, uh, my husband is, is really funny. And he and I spend most of our time, you know, laughing about stuff that's that's serious. And and in the end, we both realize that that's the way, the only way we can approach stuff that really hurts. Um, ultimately, all this stuff is so ridiculous. Uh, I tend to, to just see that that um, even when I'm going through it and it's awful, it really is like hilarious. Someone out there is laughing while this is happening to me. So the best way for me to purge that 
the sense of, uh, of, of getting picked on is just to um, to go ahead and and uh, and uh, you know take out the ridiculous part and put it on paper. And I, I mean, I've always drawn you know what I thought was funny and, uh, or you know made a joke about it. Um, and it, it seems to wash it out of you somehow. It seems to help you get rid of it. And and I personally think you can either cry or laugh. It is the same thing. It, it's the same thing. What about you, Keith? What's, what's your feeling on why you approach some of these very intense subjects from a kind of a humorous perspective? Uh, well, that's, that's really a lot of... <laughs> sometimes it's the only way uh, people will listen if, if you can get people to laugh. I, I kind of look at cartoonists as the court jesters of today, you know, where we put some fun of them. stuff. Yeah, some of them. And do you, are your slideshows that you give when you go to high schools or around, are th those are funny? Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're, they're your, co your comics. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. The way people describe them is like, well, I didn't think that a, a slideshow on police brutality and race in the U.S. would be funny, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's certainly there are parts of it that are very awkward, funny. But um, you know, that's really you get them with the funny, and then you punch them in the face when they get <laughs> close. Or pull the gun. But don't you also feel like you actually just told them more? Like sometimes I feel like that the funny that you just made, while the person's waiting to start laughing at what you just set up for them, they're also they're also absorbing way more than you could have given them in a ten page paper. Mm. I mean, and that happens in your comics all the time. I'm looking at it and when I get to the last one, I'm like, oh, he is evil. <laughs> you know, he just really made me think well, hard. I, I know the very first time I did the slideshow, I didn't make it funny. And it was, I was like, it was the saddest. I was like, I was doing it. I was like, oh my god, this is like the biggest but downer ever. That must have been very hard for you. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, I, I was fun. showing victims of police brutality. I was like quiet and just showing pictures of dead people. Like it was, just, it was like, oh my god, I mean, like I'm cleaning this up. I mean, your work is so funny. It must have been very hard to make something not funny. Yeah, well, I mean, well, I mix in statistics and, yeah. and different a lot of different things but yeah I realized that I had to make it a lot funnier to, to get it where it is today so it's well, uh, it's a skill though yeah, hard to do it, yeah. I mean you gotta you know <clears throat> it's like when you first start out as a cartoonist you can tell people who are devoted to the craft and people who are just dabbling People who are just dabbling will draw and go oh this doesn't look good and then throw it away or, or they give up people who are serious about it know that it's going to take like five or ten years before you get to where you, where you really want to be. And it's incremental. And you'll see it once you look back and go, oh my god, like, look how far I've come. But, um, you know, it's, it's that type of thing. Is you, it, whenever you start out something, you know it's not going to be good. But if you're devoted to it, you know you have to get through all that hard stuff. And I think that's like with anything. Like, it's, you have to be in it for the long run. So... That's, I knew that, that, that what I was doing was something important to me, at least, and I thought it would be important to, to everyone else, too. And you also turn um, something very autobiographical into something much bigger. I mean, uh, that's talking about police brutality is a very huge subject versus your personal experience of life. So it's amazing how you can connect those. But I, I also think that you know, the more personal, and I think we all experience this, the more yeah. personal you get, the more universal it becomes. Because we've all yeah. had that experience. Yeah. Like, you know, I, just... And people have been through some, like, you'd be, su be surprised how many other people have been through the same things you have. Yeah. I guess it's part of autobio, right? Yeah, and, and, and it might even be just from a different perspective, where they're like, right. oh, yeah, like, you know, because I always talk about, so do people say, well, I've had hard times with cops, too. And, and you know, because when they say, oh, you know, it's not just black people who have hard times with cops. And it's like, you know, 
I, I grew up in Massachusetts, so I always say this example, and there's a reason why people from Massachusetts are called mass holes. <laughs> if you've ever seen one of our sports teams win, which is quite often, um, <laughs> they get drunk, and a lot of them, you know, wreck things, and they get stopped by the cops, and they are extremely rude with the cops, and they don't end up dead. And, the po and my point is, I shouldn't have to act perfect to live. And people always say, oh, well, they shouldn't have been this. They shouldn't, they should have done this. And it's like, I shouldn't be perfect to live. That's it. That's simple as that. And I think we can all relate to that. Mm. None of us are perfect. And so for you to argue, well, they wouldn't have got shot if they just did this or just mm. did that. It's like, please, you know, don't make these silly arguments. You know, we're human beings. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And I make it funny. <laughs> you guys also do a lot of self-deprecating in your strips and poking fun at yourself and also like how you draw yourselves. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I have an example here, um, November from your right. comic. Well, you gotta have to laugh at yourself. Like he said, no one is perfect, you know? And I think no one should really take themselves too seriously. Just what can you do in life but <laughs> laugh or, like she said, laugh or cry, that I'd rather laugh. So this, like, in a nutshell, this story is a, a really drunken night in San Francisco. Um, I, a lot happened, uh, there's cops involved and all, but I guess the highlight of the evening was I drunkenly proposed to my now husband. And uh, the funny thing is that he had already gotten a ring and I had no clue. And I meant, hi, <laughs> he's here, sucker. And so... <laughs> did it all work out? Yeah, it did. But apparently I was, I was like, um, I had this bright idea. I was like, hey, hey we should get married. And he was like, oh, maybe we should save this for another time, because I was like blackout and drunk. And I was like, why not? Why don't you want to marry me? And I said, is it because you're chicken? And I was like, buck, 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 and you know, I was like, you're chicken. And he says, like, he's like, oh, uh, that's why I added, like, he probably reconsidered for a bit, like, hmm, maybe I should think about this for a while. But he uh, eventually, did propose after much consideration. <laughs> but see, I mean, I'm just saying, you, you gotta, you know, I mean, it's a, I can be an annoying drunk, and I'm sure other people can be annoying drunk sometimes, and, yeah, you know, I just gotta, like, roll with the punches, I guess. <laughs> which, <laughs> just, uh, which you actually know. get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I got punched in the face. Yeah, yeah I rolled with it. And I just, it happens, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's all I got to say about that. That's my chicken dance, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the questions along with self-deprecation is how, um, what are the challenges with putting family and friends and kids in your strips and how has that affected you guys? Um, Jennifer, this is a page you sent me from your story with your mother. I wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit about the experience of putting her in and, and, and what you've done on this page to show that. Well, it's a whole complicated issue, you know, selling your family um, up the river for, um, you know, to, for fame, for, for to, to be funny, <laughs> and um, and I've always made fun of my family to 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 make jokes because they're joke worthy. But um, you know, in telling my own story, I mean, uh, you, you I, I wanted to answer the self-deprecating just very quickly. I don't think you are a trustworthy narrator, even in comedy, unless you are as self-deprecating, more self-deprecating than you are mean to the other characters. You have to be meaner to yourself. You have to make more fun of yourself than you make of anybody else if you're going to be a, a, a worthwhile narrator in a comedy, essentially. So in this part of my book, um, I'm, uh, I'm ranking on my mother's inability to talk about stuff. And I... Um, have made a lot of fun of her for this, and luckily by the time I was published, she was too old to understand what comics really were, and she didn't understand what I was making fun of. But it, it certainly is the whole reason that I'm a confessional artist, that I was, I was bound and gagged, you know, metaphorically when I was a teenager. I mean, I think that much is clear. And I did want to add, um, while these images are up, um, that, uh, can I talk about the, yes. The, yes okay, okay, there are two quotes here, which you may or may not pick up on. Um, I put these in for the comics nerds. Um, I uh, 
uh, asterisks and obliques uh, is what I am stealing from in the top right panel. I'm um, wrapped up like Cacophonix the Bard. Whenever the uh, asterisks and obliques they have, the whole village has a festival of celebration. The Bard will say, ah, you know, and I'll sing a song, and they quickly, you know, um, bind and gag him because he's such a lousy musician, and they don't want to hear him. And this is how I'm feeling in my family. I'm ready to, you know, tell them everything, and they really don't want to hear it, especially my mother. And over here, um, you know, Peanuts was another influence on me. I read a lot of Peanuts. And um, so we, we, the doctor is in, you know. Uh, who is it who does that? It's Lucy? Yeah. Lucy, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so I'm, I'm being Lucy, which is perfect. You know, giant mouth, you know. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, that's, so, you know, it's, 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 and it's all a way of processing pain, you know. I mean, as you go through your, your, uh, your, own, your life story, it's like all these little rounds of pain. But being silly about it is very liberating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ignis, you were telling me about some of the negative reactions you got to the New Yorker strip that we showed. I wonder if you could talk about, like, putting your kids in strips and what, what that experience is like. Mm-hmm. They said, don't draw me again. <laughs> uh, uh, um, there's got to be some way to get back at them for all the suffering they've put me through. I mean, uh, um, they're, they're great. Um, well, uh, the strip was about traveling with m- children and how they don't appreciate museums or archaeological sites or wherever we wanted to go. And um, people reacted uh, on Facebook negatively because they're spoiled, overprivileged uh, brats who have a lot in life. Um, I never got to travel when I was a little kid and or go any of these places. I loved museums when I was forced to go to them by my parents. Um, so it's a so some of the reason why I um, I drew these situations is is out of the amazement of how how this generation is very different. And uh, and most of this traveling we we're doing was for work and less for. Uh, vacation, so we had to bring the children, but um, people did say things that were really negative, and I felt badly, like um, I am making my own children into um, um, brats who don't appreciate what they have. Uh, I think that happens with every generation that comes along. The generation before thinks that about the younger um, people, but I got a lot of also positive feedback for this um, of people without children who said something like, uh, my boyfriend is impossible to travel with also, or I was like this when I was a kid. So I think it's, it's, um, it's a snap reaction that um, I'm glad to generate the conversation about um, parents and children and what you, what you, how you spend your time with them. Um, and also with drawing about the children. I think um, not all the work I do is about my children. I'm embarking on um, projects, uh, and I've worked on projects about my own life before children, because there was a, quite a lot of it. Um, and other subjects, I've drawn a lot of things with um, uh, Greek myth or um, it just so happens that as daily life goes on, these kids say, um, the darndest things, and I can't help <laughs> write them down. And it's a little bit, like you said, um, Keith, like to keep you from going crazy. Like, is it just me, or is this ridiculous? I mean, um, so that's and Keith, you've it. got a. Uh, so this is Jennifer. You have a strip here with your kids. I wonder if you could talk about kind of how you use your children for humor in the strip. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, okay. This is uh, Daddy. Look at the huge mess we made, <laughs> and I say, a fine, fine mess it is, son. But you do realize your mom will go phase seven when she sees this. And he goes, phase seven? I said, yeah, phase seven is when your mom gets so mad that her head splits apart, revealing a much larger head that breathes fire and shoots laser out, lasers out of its eyes. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but you know Charlie the dog, <coughs> the one up the street that really likes you? And he says, yep. I said, that's your older brother, Chet. <laughs> you were too young to remember, but Chet made your mom go phase seven, and she turned him into a dog with those laser eyes. 
hundreds of times. Thankfully, the neighbors took them in, so we can still be a family. <laughs> I'm just saying, you can leave this place the way it is and take a chance, or you can clean it up and not find out what Alpo tastes like. And say, okay, okay, we're cleaning up. So, uh, <laughs> Did that work? <laughs> It, it started, yeah, it's I say strategy. she will go <laughs> phase seven. There is, there is a small window where you can lie to your kids, <laughs> and it's the greatest thing in the world. And I just actually did one, uh, uh, did, uh, one where um, a kid came up to me, and he was like, Dad, Dad, like he showed me a big wheel. And he was like, oh, I want this, I want this. And uh, luckily, you know, in, in the big wheels and the toy things, there's always a kid on it. And I go, can you find one without a kid? Because we already have two kids. Like, I'm not going to, yeah, that comes, that comes with a kid. And, he's, and he couldn't find one without a kid. So I, you know, so I, I, I love just <laughs> screwing with them. Uh, kids while I are, can. there is nothing funnier than a kid. Yeah. It just isn't. We, we, the, the VCR was broken. The kid wanted to watch his, his tape. I'm like, the VCR is at the store. It's it's getting fixed. You know, we can't watch anything. And it's like, well, that, this is what I want to watch. I mean, it's tiny. Finally, I said, okay, put it in. Put it in. <laughs> and he walked with it over to me. Uh, 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 okay. <laughs> like, that's what it takes sometimes. Yeah. Little kids are like dogs that can talk. And, um, and, and they're just as dumb as dogs. <laughs> in a nice way. And, in a nice way. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the one, thing, uh, the one thing I didn't want to do is, like, you know, my strips to turn into just, you know, kitty strips. So that's why no, it's a mix, it's a mix of stuff. But, you know, so much stuff happens with your kids. You can, you can go on and on with them. But, um, you know, there's enough, you know, if I, if I can't go somewhere else, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do a kitty strip here because, uh, right. you know. There's always material. Yeah, there's oh, always yeah. material. Well, on that note, like, I'm the only one without kids. But, like, since I moved back home, my mom is kind of nuts. So when I run out of material, I just have lunch with her, and it's like gold. <laughs> like, because she's like, you know, she's like old, this Filip old Filipino woman, she has like zero filter, and it's like all innocent. Like, once she, uh, like, for example, once she uh, visited me in San Francisco in a restaurant, and she was like, ha ha, you know your dad, when he gets tipsy, you can tell, because he gets all chinky eyed. And I was like, shh. <laughs> She's like, well, I understand. You're all so sensitive. Like these days, like, what's wrong with you people? No one has a sense of humor. It's just like, you know. Uh, like, uh, wait, that's you know. where you get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like my, my um, or once my sister, and like, you know, it's not to be mean, but it's just like, this how my family shows her love. We're not very like, I love you. We're just like, we're very blunt. And, you know, my, my sister showed her once, like, hey, check out my passport photo with, came out good for once. And my mom was like, they might not recognize you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> get over this. <laughs> so I always bring my iPhone when I have lunch with him. I'm, like, I'm, I'm out, out of material and I'm like, notes, yes. Like, uh, so yeah, I mean, like, family members are good for <laughs> Yeah, they are, they are. Did you guys ever hear any negative things from your family or your friends about using them in your strips? Uh, my dad, who never looks at my, he, you know, Whenever I see him, he lives in Vegas, um, and he's always like, you know, are you making any money? Are you making any money? Like, that's all he says. <laughs> but he, he gets phone calls from people sometimes who see the strips, and he goes, I heard you did this, and then the strip about me. And I always lie to him and say, oh, no, like, you're like the favorite character. Everybody writes and says, oh, your dad's the favorite character, but yeah, I, 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 I totally rip him all the time. He, he's, you know, he loves salt. Salt? Yeah, salt. Like, he will salt a saltine. He will, <laughs> he will salt, uh, what, it, anchovies. He will do any, like, and, uh, will so. Will ever salt a sweet? Uh, he, he will salt anything. Oh. But uh, I draw him in the strip where he, he has a salt shaker in every room, so there's one in the bathroom, there's one in the bedroom, <laughs> just <laughs> random salt. And, and actually, I, I have him developed into like a salt, he has a salt blog, and so people a send him blog. salt from all, all, all over the place. And now I have him having it. You ever see that guy uh, online who like salts things like that? So my dad has become that in the strip. You know, you know it's not real, but uh, he's become a, a salt uh, sommelier or whatever. Salt, salt, salt sommelier. Yeah, uh, whatever. 
um, at a local restaurant, but um, he's like, I don't eat, I don't eat that much salad. <laughs> I was like, yeah, Dad, okay. It's a comic. Everything's over the top. Everything's over the top. So. What about you, Jennifer? In your story, you use a lot of your family from multiple generations. I do, and and actually, I try to make it very. Uh, I, I didn't change anything. I didn't, you know, I keep it, I keep it um, pretty much to the truth. To me, the humor is in, is in the juxtaposition, you know, of to like what I'm trying to do and what they're trying to do. It's, it's an emotional bumping up against each other. And then I leave it to the reader to be the arbitrator. And hopefully they're looking at this and going, yeah, well, that's an impossible. Th and like Jennifer's and, totally right. Well, no, actually, <laughs> one thing I loved about, do uh, I had in the past tried to write some of these stories. And um, in writing them, I could never get the right tone. When I tried to draw these stories, um, I could draw my mother face as I'm being, you know, a complete 20-year-old uh, shit to her, and I can draw her going like, you know, and being patient slash understanding slash not really caring anymore, I wish she'd get over this face. And this was all stuff that would have been too hard for me to explain, also it wouldn't have been as funny, but I knew that this was happening to everybody else, and so it would be, you know, as long as I had the picture, as well as the words, I was able to convey it. And and so a lot of this is, is ends up being physical comedy or... Um, uh, emotional comedy to me, um, and as I've said, sit comedy too, situation comedy. Um, it's all uh, because it's all in the storytelling, and it's all in these clashes of emotion and not understanding. Uh, two people completely not understanding where the other person is coming from. That really, I do love that. And, yeah. and I just want to say, like, that's the greatest thing about this medium is we can use illustration and we can use text and we can have arrows pointing to things and we can do, make references to different uh, um, other older strips or movies or anything. It's such a great medium to work in because, like, there's no... There's no unrealistic way of doing it. Like no one sits there and goes, "Oh, that's not really that person's head splitting apart," and blah blah blah. That's not really real. It represents someone getting extremely angry. You know, we we all get that. Which mm -hmm. um, there's really no other uh, way to do this stuff. I think in a more effective way than with comics. So mm -hmm. it's uh, we're. We're very lucky to work. Oh. <laughs> I meant to spell that uh, when I finished some deep, <laughs> meaningful thing. But we're very lucky to work in this meeting uh, and to do this stuff. Um, and and I just want to say this. I said it yesterday. Um, uh, and we're very fortunate that folks like you have found us as creators, because we are not floating at the top of the sort of pop culture thing, you know? I said this yesterday, you ever notice how like the worst music uh, you always hear, like you can't avoid? Constantly. Because yeah. it's on pop Most radio, it's on TV, it's like you can't avoid it. And yeah. you, you really have to dig in the crates to find the good stuff, you know? And that's that's not just with music, it's not just with hip-hop, it's with comics, it's with it's with literature, it's with history, it's all that stuff. We have to dig in the crates and find the stuff, so, um, uh, you know, it's not going to be just served to us really easily. So, uh, I want to thank everybody here for, for you know, making uh, our, our careers viable and, and seeking our work out and, and, and giving us support, so thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and on that note, I mean, I would love to open it up to questions. Um, I don't know if there are any cartoon, uh, aspiring memoirists or current working memoirists, but please feel free to answer, uh, ask the panel any questions. Just kind of raise your hand. Anybody want to ask the panelists a question? If not, I have more. <laughs> okay. I think Bruce is making a move. <laughs> so in terms of what you've done, what's embarrassed you the most after it came out? Do you each have interesting stories there? That's great. Most embarrassing things? Yeah. 
Actually, I'm embarrassed all the time. People come yes. to me and say, so, you know, that thing you wrote about your, you know, I mean, it's, and, and I'll be like, oh, did I really? I don't even know that. That's really bad. It, it, it always makes me, I mean, rather than answer your question, I just want to add this. Um, when you do autobio, when you do autobio, you go into a state of amnesia while you're working. You think this is between you and the piece of paper, and no one will ever see it. <laughs> and then? In fact, you start thinking of your character on the paper as her or she. She's got to go. She's going to go to the bathroom now, and then she's going to have that big dust up with her mother, and then she's going to go bonk her husband. And you know, and and you don't even think of it as you anymore. And then it comes out. It's published, and then your friends read it. <laughs> and their moms and dad, and whoever, and utter strangers, and they come up to your table and start talking to you about this, this embarrassing thing that you put in the book. And it's like they know you. Yeah, and at that moment, you're realizing, oh, yeah, you know, this is something I would have saved till our third drunken evening of talking around the kitchen table, but instead, you know it now, and I don't even know you. I'm not even sure I want to get drunk with you. So it's just, um, you know, I believed at the time that I was putting it out there for a good reason, and hopefully I turned it into art, and hopefully it, I didn't just sacrifice. But there is a level of um, embarrassment sometimes, and especially if I think the person did not receive it the right way. That happens too. Yeah. You, I, I, I'm more, I, I have a story of being embarrassed of something I didn't do, which is I was on a bus in San Francisco. Um, I lived there for 16 years, and there was someone on the bus, and they were like, um, I was with a friend, and, and someone on the bus was like, oh, you're Keith Knight, the cartoonist. And I said, yeah, yeah. And they said, oh, I, you know, I love your work. Uh, my favorite one was when you did this one, and blah, blah, blah. They went into describing it, and they were describing a strip that I didn't do. Oh, no. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Are you sure? Or you just forget. Or? I did. Well, this is. They. The, I said. I said. You know. I didn't do that strip. And uh, they said. You know. Are you sure? Like you know. Blah blah blah. You, sure? you know. It was autobiographical. Blah blah blah. And they're describing. It. I was like, listen. I. You know. I totally remember. You know. I've been doing it a while, but I. I remember. That the strip that I would do, and my friend who was with me, turns. He goes. Are you sure? That sounds like something you would do. Like, <laughs> so the person who was saying nice things to me suddenly thought I was an asshole, and then I was pretending that I didn't do the strip just to not talk to them. And they were just like, well, fuck you. <laughs> and just like left the bus. And, and I had not done that strip, I just want to say. Like, <laughs> it was a good strip, but I didn't do it. Like, I'm not going to take credit for someone else's work, so I just want to say that. I was embarrassed. Oh, oh, I'm I get it. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I get embarrassed on a daily basis, so it's a little big. I'm embarrassed right now, so it's, <laughs> it's fine. But on that note, I just want to say, um, before I forget, uh, I read this quote, and for me, it's like really, really the way I approach writing, uh, humor and memoir. Is that, um, is that the quote says something like, if everything is happy, nothing is happy, and if everything is sad, nothing is sad. So I think it's important to have that tension, or that like you know, that kind of like contrast. When that's what I like to do with, I mean, that's how I, I don't know if you guys, that's how you approach it, like we're dealing with like serious situations. But like, that's why you put the, the humor part in it. I mean. I don't know. Well, that's that's the twist, and also if you're working in a long work, you know, my book is like 300 plus pages. You have to, the, the reader is just going to fall asleep if it's too much of one thing or another. Yeah. So you have to keep, you know, switching not only from like crowd scenes to close-ups, but but you know, um, and different issues and different personalities. But it's got to also always keep moving from uh, uh, sorrow to from from grief to laughter and and back. You know, yeah. I didn't mean for any of mine to be funny. <laughs> Does he have a question? Hi, um, I'm a comic artist and I work with uh, some autobiographical projects, but uh, the one I'm working on right now is also uh, surrealized and kind of fictionalized, like somewhat removed. So uh, I know that. My question is, I know that myself and a lot of other artists find that uh, putting down the autobiographical work is very uh, therapeutic in dealing with the uh, 
of uh, more dark and serious uh, feelings and situations, but I was wondering if uh, any of you have had experience with uh, that kind of therapeutic feeling in directly autobiographical stuff where you're, you're showing yourself in those experiences as opposed to something that's uh, more fictionalized but just inspired by those. Yeah, I, it, it is. It's totally therapeutic. If you can, you know, doing cartoons after it gives you a chance to maybe even put in the stuff you should have done or the stuff you, or, or just sort of acknowledging some of the power that you feel sometimes. Um, you know, I was um, thinking about uh, that fight that you got in. Mm -hmm. Um, I it, it totally reminded me of another San Francisco bus story. <laughs> oh, those San Francisco buses! <laughs> They're a lot of fun. Where, when the door opens in the back, people try to rush on in the back. Um, and and I had just gotten married, and uh, my wife was coming off the bus, and and she wouldn't move this for this guy who was trying to get on the bus, and. So, you know, she stood her ground, and you could tell the guy got a little pissed. He backed out, and then she went down the stairs. And then when he went by her, he elbowed her in the head, not knowing that her husband was right there. Oh. And, uh, you know, it was a perfect situation because I had higher ground. And uh, I reached <laughs> out and grabbed him by whatever shirt he had and just yanked him up the stairs and uh, and then I, I threw him down and he banged his head off one of those seats and I, I didn't mean to do that but I was like that was nice yeah. yeah I was like that's my fucking life like <laughs> like seriously I didn't know I had it in me and, uh, and, and people were like take it easy man take it easy and, like the dude was like I'm sorry I'm sorry and, and, and you know I got off the bus, and I, I, my wife was looking at me like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> she was secretly <laughs> impressed. Oh, for sure. well, yeah. I, was, I was not secret. I was, over, I was outwardly impressed with myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, like, 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 let's, you know, yeah let's, let's, let's do something to get all this energy out. But, you know, it was just being able to kind of do a comic about that and, and sort of the empowerment and for, sort of feeling that anger and all that stuff because... Here's the thing. This is why you ever see the the videos of people doing pranks on people where they like dress as like a, 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 yeah fails. Yeah. There's like two or three of them where where somebody's hiding in something and a black person comes to the door and they pop up oh. and the black person just clocks them. Like black people are full of rage all the time. So any excuse you give them. <laughs> to hit a white person, <laughs> it's all going to be in there. So I think that rage was so sitting cool. in there. You're it was so like, cool. We love you. Like 28, 28 or 30 years of like just frustration coming out there. So, um, But that's why I think, uh, I don't know if anyone's a hockey fan, but some of the best uh, uh, fighters uh, in hockey, hockey some of the best uh, are black people because um, they get to beat up white people in front of thousands of white people. And it's, uh, it's very Cathartic. Everybody watch this hockey, hockey fight. fights. Hockey fights.com. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, my dad watched hockey for the first time. We do have to wrap oh, up and clean out. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, but I want to thank you guys very much. This is a really awesome panel. Um, just real quickly before we go, can you guys just say where you are in the in the convention room so that if yes. people want to come talk or check out your books, uh, they can do that? Apparently, I, I, I said yesterday I was in row W and there's no row W. I think I think, I think it means wall. Yeah. That's oh, like oh, the wall oh, where okay. Fanagraphics oh, is. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. West I'm, wall. I'm on the side where Fanagraphics is. Um, uh, if you're walking all the way to the right, and uh, and I have a special guest, uh, Steve Notley, Bobby Flower is with me, and also um, my family's with me, so you can see them live. Uh, just don't tell them the truth about the, uh, <laughs> the big wheel. So. And I'm also on the wall, but I'm on the opposite side. I'm on W11 with Pick and Hawk. Pick and Hawk, foggy notions, come over. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Um, on the I Island next to Kilgore Books, which is on the end, right in the middle. And I have Reign of Crumbs and Greek Diary and more. And I'm at the top shelf table. You can't miss them there right as you come in from the main door on the long side. OK, great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.